I have a third part in the compression uh, chapter for you, which is about text transforms. And these are a bit, a bit weird at first because they're not compression methods by themselves, but they somehow make text more compressible without compressing themselves. So they just bring things that compression methods cannot use right away to the surface so that they can be used. And we'll see some, uh, some two examples of this uh, that, that nicely highlight this. It's just um, yeah, a, a curiosity that the compression methods cannot do this right away, but uh, there's effective ways around that. If we, if we look again at the three big compression methods we looked at so far, that was run length encoding, Huffman encoding, and Lempelsif Welsh, uh, then you see they, they have some, uh, some things that they like and that what they're, where they are really effective. Run length encoding, as the name says, if you have long runs, repetitions of the same character. Uh, Huffman is good if there are some characters that are much more frequent than others, or vice versa, if there's some characters that are much less frequent than others. And Lempelsif Welsh is, is good for picking up exact repetitions, right? So that's, that's the, the positive things. Uh, there's many things where it is frustratingly ineffective to use the, the compression methods we've just seen uh, as they are. Even though as a human, if you look at it, you see, like, you see there is something going on in terms of repetition that you would like to, uh, to capture. Uh, a simple example for Lempelsif Welsh is uh, what I mentioned before. If you have uh, an exact copy from very far ago, um, then you might not find it just because the dictionary is just not big enough. And keeping the dictionary growing has downsides too. So this, the, the solution is not just to keep the dictionary growing. Uh, we might want a, a fundamentally different way to approach these long distance repetitions. Uh, Huffman coding, the way we did it, uh, suppose the first half of the text is all A's and the second half of the text is all B's. Huffman would still say, use one bit per character, and then the, the compressed text would essentially look the same as the source text. Whereas obviously, uh, something like run length encoding would work well in this case. If you have something slightly less artificial, in the first half of the text, A's are much more frequent than B's, but it's still not quite all A's. And the second half, the other way around, B's are much more frequent. It, it still feels like you want to compress this better than what Huffman would do, by averaging all the frequencies and not compressing at all. Uh, but it's not completely obvious how to do this. And well, run length encoding, of course, in the way we presented it is so limited that there's many ways you can imagine to trick it into not finding some repetitions. So text transformations try to bring out these features so that they are uh, compressible with the other methods um, Ex to exploit such types of, um, of repetitions. So they are, um, they're called transformations because they take the source text and produce some coded text and they have to be invertible, but by themselves they don't achieve compression. And so they're usually used uh, as part of a bigger pipeline. You first feed your source text through some transforms and then through some compression and for the decoding, it's the opposite. And right? you always have to go back the same way as you came in, in, in encoding. The first example of a transformation is called the move to front transformation. It's um, in principle a fairly simple transformation and it might not seem very useful at first sight, but it's historically the one that combined with the second one gives you the, the, most, the most effective compression for English language text and some other um, types of, of inputs. So let's have a look at this. Um, who has seen the move to front heuristic for self-adjusting linear lists? topic that sometimes uh, appears in some data structure classes, um, often to introduce uh, competitive analysis in online algorithms, uh, but it's maybe not so standard to cover it even, even in CS undergrads. So has anyone seen it? 
Okay. Uh, it's only vaguely related to that, so we don't really have to uh, get into that. The idea is you keep a linked list of some objects, and it's not sorted, this list. Um, and so let's do a small example, maybe. Okay, I have space down here. I'll just do this with letters. Um, and say this is null. So it's just three elements in my list. Now, when I want to access an element, I traverse from the start. So here's that's the start. That's where I always uh, begin my search. I go through the list until I have found the element. And after that, I make that element the first element in the list. So if we access z, we go through the list until we find z. And then we take it out of the list. Remember, in a linked list, you can take elements out by just rewiring pointers. So this is it's a cheap operation to put. Um, well, I can, I can, if you want, I can keep this in the same layout, and uh, then it's closer to what the algorithm would do. So you make the start point to Z, then that points to the old beginning of the list, and Y now points to null. So I've I've just taken Z and put it at the front of the list not changing the relative order of anything else. Okay, that's that's what's spelled out in, in, in the text here. And you keep doing like this. When I uh, do the next axis, maybe that's to set again. Then I find it at the first position. And if I then access, uh, access say, x, then I would swap x and, and z. So the idea in this is, over time, if you keep accessing elements like this, those that are have been accessed frequently, or those that have been accessed lately, they end up in the, be in the beginning of the list. And so you get cheap access to them, because the time to traverse through the list, of course, is the same as the number of elements you, you visit. And so uh, if you've seen something just before, then it's at the front. And if not, then it's a little further in the list. Uh, but uh, they're roughly ordered by the, least access, the, uh, the last access to them. So it's a way to somehow learn access patterns without explicitly doing anything. It's just following this, this heuristic. Uh, that's, that's the move to front heuristic because of the obvious property. If you access something, you put it at the front. Good. We'll just use this and apply it on the alphabet characters of our text and basically see what happens. So here, our list contains all the symbols in the alphabet. You have to initially sort them somehow. So we'll start with alphabetic order initially. To access, uh, to encode a character of the source text now, we access that element in the list. And to, to encode it, we write down its position in the list. So the number of elements we had to follow. And after that, we apply the move to front heuristic. So what this means is if you access a, a character more often, it will get smaller numbers, right? Uh, the code words here are just integers. It's one of the examples where we don't go to binary right away. But remember, move to front by itself doesn't really compress well. So this is the first step in a pipeline anyways. Um, and so let's, let's see an example where we can point out this property. Yeah, before that, I wanted to see if you understood the rule. So pretend you have x, y, z, a, b, c in your list initially, and then you access a. What does the list look like after that?
Okay, it looks good. Um, give you a second to vote, but seems that one was was doable. And well, you can still cast your vote, but uh, let me let me continue because it seems uh, easy enough. So if we access A, we have to move from the front till we find A, and then we just take it out and put it at the beginning. So we have A, and then followed by the rest, just with A removed from that list. Okay? Oh, you don't see it. You did see it. All good then? Did I make any silly mistakes? Uh, looks okay to me. Good. So that's the rule. Um, and this time, because it's simple enough, here's the code first. We'll do a, a tiny example afterwards. So maybe I'll sit through quickly on that one. Um, in coding, you start with the list containing the letters in alphabetic order. Start with the empty the empty string for the coded text, and then you go through each of the letters. Uh, you find it. Um, oh, sorry. That's the you find the next character in the text. Then you find the position of that character in the move to front list. That's um, the position P. That is your code word. And then you move C to the front of the list. I didn't spell out the code for that, but I guess you could imagine how to do that. I wanted to point out in this case how very parallel the encoding and decoding is. So the decoding does the same. It starts with the list in sorted order. Uh, it starts with the empty source text. That's what it produces. But then it iterates through all the positions in the coded text. And now instead of finding a character, it finds the position. So it, go, it jumps to position P in the move to front list and gets the character from there uh, and then outputs that and then does the same move to front step, OK? Of course, it's important that they do this nicely in lockstep. Otherwise, we wouldn't decode to the same thing that we started with. And so I want to run through a quick example, not to show the procedure again, but to show you an example of what happens if you do this transformation. So relatively quickly, we find i in the list. That's so the, we start with the whole alphabet in sorted order. We find i, it's at position 8, so that's what we put out. And then we have to move i to the beginning and move the rest uh, just over. So you see uh, i is at the beginning, then there's a, b, c, d, e, and uh, between h and j, where i was before, this is gone. Okay. Uh, next character, n, we find at position 13. So that's our output, and n has to move to the beginning. And then that's what you're left with. So n is here, i is here, and then all the others. Uh, and between m and o, n is missing. Next character is an e, so we find this in position 6. That's our output. And then e goes to the front, and so on and so forth. I think uh, it's kind of clear how this works. So let me jump through this more quickly now. Um, OK, here's, here's the final result. And let's spend a second to, um, to ponder over what, what happens during this encoding, what happens with this transformation. Uh, instead of letters, we have numbers now. That's obvious. What is a, um, if we have a run of the same character in the source text, for example, here, ff, what does that translate to in the coded text? Now, uh, yeah, it, it would have been nice to properly align these two things. As you can see, um, the second f becomes a zero. And of course, it has to, because after f has been accessed, it's at the beginning of the move to front list. And so next time it's used, it's at position zero. So runs of the same symbol, the same symbol rep uh, repeated several times in the source gives you a run of zeros in the coded text, except for the first occurrence. And now the other way around, uh, what if we have something funny like these, um, 
repeated characters in the coded text, the three threes, uh, what could that mean? The, well, it's the characters here. And maybe you can visually spot that there's another occurrence of this string. And if you check, this is exactly three characters ago of four if you, we start counting at zero, okay? So, so if you go back by index, um, there's, there's three things in between. And so that's, that's another general thing. Um, you get these, uh, these runs in the output if you had a, a repeated string in the input. That feels like something useful for compression. Um, that was something a bit like Lample Sif, where we tried to do th things as well. It's a little more limited if between the two occurrences, there are other occurrences of the same letters, the nice run gets a bit destroyed. Then uh, you get numbers that are smaller than the three in between. If there was between the CIE, CIE, if there was another uh, E, then um, we wouldn't get a three here. But uh, it at least gives you some hint, some intuition what, what might be going on there. Okay, as I said as before, it doesn't uh, compress by itself, but because of these two properties, it sometimes can bring out compressibility that's otherwise hidden. Uh, if you wanted to en encode the code words, you have to think about that, um, but uh, you usually put some other things after it. Uh, the, the key application of move to front, at least historically, comes from after another transform, and that's the one I want to look at next. Um, and yeah, there are different options how to encode the code words. I don't want to get too much into the details of that. 